You are welcome to today's celebration of God's faithfulness. We are happy you are here. And we know for sure that God has something to give to you today. God has a word for you. God has a blessing for you. God has an instruction for you. So relax as we allow God to do what only he can do in our lives. Let us start by an opening prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for life. We thank you for health. Father, we thank you, King of Louis, Lord God, for well-being. We thank you for your presence. Father, we thank you for bringing us to today's celebration of your faithfulness, of your love, of your kindness. King of kings, Lord of lords, as we gather here today, we ask, Lord God, the Lord, you speak to our hearts. You instruct us. The Lord God, you strengthen us. You embolden us. And the King of glory, Lord God, you will refire us, Lord God, for your purpose. And Lord God, lead us, King of glory, Lord God, to pastures green. That your name may be glorified. That your purpose in our lives be done. That your glory will be seen in our lives. And that men will give you praise. That people will see us and look at our lives and say, yes, yeah, God has been good. Today, King of Louis, as we gather, Lord, may we not live here the same. By the time we live here, may we be completely transformed by your glory. Have your way, King of Glory, Lord of Lords, Everlasting Father, Eternal King. Have your way in our lives. Glorify yourself. Be thou honored. Be thou glorified. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. You're welcome.
ready to praise God this morning?
Ephesians 5, from verse 16 to 18. Okay. Ephesians 5, 16 to 18, read. I'm reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. And it says, Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living, like, living life with honor and purpose and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. That's Ephesians 5. From verse 15 to 6, yes, 15 to 17, amplified version. The King James put that same scripture, specifically Ephesians 5 16. It says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time for the days are evil. So if today's short message was going to be given a title, it will be what are you doing to redeem the time? Our sister, by God's special grace, redeemed the time. I believe she's now with the Lord God. Her time has come to an end. What are you doing with the time that you have left? You see, the word redeeming, the word deem, in the word redeeming, so D-E-E-M, D-E-M, deem means to own something. So when you hear the word redeem, it's to own that thing again. And so when God talks about redeeming the time, God is making us see that we had lost time before. We had lost time. And so the, the, the request is for us to Try and get back the time we have lost. Redeem the time. Why? Because it says the days are evil. <clears throat> okay? So when it talks about redeeming time, it means that there are things we need to do to redeem time. Like we need to be more disciplined because time does not wait, right? Time does not wait. The thing about time, which is very interesting, is that Every one of us, every single one of us, we have a limited time, but yet we have equal time. So whether you are, you are, you know, poor or whether you are rich, you have 24 hours a day. Whether you are of, of, from, of one race or another race, you are black, you are white, you are yellow, whatever you are, you have 24 hours a day. Whether you are tall, short, fat, whatever, you have 24 hours a day. That's how God did it. God made sure that when it comes to time, nobody has an advantage. Nobody has an advantage by race, by location, by whatever. Nobody has an advantage. We all have 24 hours a day. That is a very important thing that God did there. Pointing out that what you become in life, how much progress you make in life, is dependent on you. What you do with the time, equal time, that God has given to you and given to any other person. And that's why you see in studies on, man, on management, studies on, on, on different things about, um, you know, wealth, prosperity, one focus is how to manage time, how to do more within a specific time, because we all have the same time. So the person who does more, who redeems the time, is the one who achieves the, the, the most and the one who progresses the most. 
And that's why the question for you and I today is, what are you doing with the time that God has given you? Okay? In Psalm 90, verse 12, Psalm 90, verse 12, The psalmist says, so Lord, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. The Good News Bible reads, renders that same scripture like this. It says, teach us how short our life is so that we may become wise. In other words, if you know how short your life is, you will know the urgency of the things you need to do. When you look at young, young people, especially teenagers, they say they, I mean, they, 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 they feel that the, the, the world is like, it's never going, going to end. They have a long <coughs> years ahead of them. But as you get older, you begin to realize that it's not true. And so this, the psalmist was praying to God and said, God, teach me how brief, how short my life is. So that in everything I do from now on, after I know, I'll be wiser. I'll use my time wisely. I'll do what is important. I'll do what is critical. I'll do what needs to be done. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 29 to 31, it reads like this. It says, but let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, the time that remains is very short. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 7, 29 to 30. That the time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep or rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy or their, of their possessions. Those who use the things of this world should not become attached to them. For this world as we know it will soon pass away. The scripture again is letting us see that we must not become stuck with either a sorrow or either a, 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 a thing of joy or, or, you know, we should not become stuck. Yeah, yeah, that great thing, that is life. Life is such that things happen. You know, things that are good happen in life and things that are bad have happened in life. It's just the way life is. That is life. But we must not become stuck at any point. We must not become stuck, you know, in any of those seasons. We must evaluate we must have a good evaluation of the time we have so that we can redeem the time, so that we can do those things. I mean, we can value our time. Your time is a lot more than how we value it so that we can do what it is that we need to do. Okay? Proverbs 10, verse 5. Proverbs 10 verse 5 points out to us who is wise. It says, he who gathers during summer and takes advantage of his opportunities or her opportunities is a son or a daughter who acts wisely. But he who sleeps during harvest and ignores the moment of opportunity is a son or daughter who acts shamefully. Every day you wake up, it's a day of opportunity. Every time you sleep, you wake up. God cleans up the day and starts with you. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. Because why? Because great is God's faithfulness. When you sleep and wake up, it is a new opportunity. God's mercy is renewed in your life, giving you another opportunity, another time to redeem the time and move fast for all the lost time that there has been the day before. Psalm 34, 39, sorry. Psalm 39 for verse 4 and 5 says this. Psalm 
39, 4 and 5 says this. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV. It says, O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am, how short, how, 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 how short, how, how fast my life goes, you know, goes away. Verse 5 says, Behold, you made my days a few hands breadth. You know, like it measures it in like centimeters or more, yeah. You, you made my, my days a few hand, hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stand as a mere breath. The Bible does not stop in letting us know over and over and over that our time is the most valuable thing, valuable thing we have, and yet our time is not a lot. It is not infinite. It is finite. It is actually very small, very short. And by doing that, God is trying to encourage us to make do, to, 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 to move fast with what he has given to us. To redeem the time. For the days are evil. I want to bring out a quote. I want to remind you myself and, and you, a quote that, that I've heard a few times. And it's the quote that is very instructive of what we need, how, the, the focus we need to give to time. Two millennia earlier, the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, pronounced, and he was the first person that made this quote two millennia ago. He said, Perfection of character is this. And what is it? To live each day as if it were your last, without frenzy, without apathy, without pretense. I'll read that again. Perfection of character is this. To live each day as if it were your last, without frenzy, without apathy, without pretense. Muhammad Ali, the one who calls himself the greatest. Yeah, he was a great boxer. In, in his book, Motivate Yourself, he wrote, live every day as if it were your last, because someday you are going to be right. <laughs> live every day as if it were your last, because someday you are going to be right. But the person that popularized this particular quote is the marvel of the, of the 21st century, Steve Jobs, of Apple, of Pixar animation, and of next computers. And you know, I was fortunate many years ago to read a technical mag magazine or article on the smartphone, the invention of the smartphone. At that time, none of the handheld devices we call phones had been made. IBM had tried. A lot of bigger companies in tech had tried to make this phone that is a handheld device. No one, no one has succeeded. And the article was saying that Steve Jobs and Apple were, had taken interest in this particular project. And the technical hands in that article said that because Steve Jobs had taken interest in that in this project, that they, 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 they are sure, that they, they, they are you know, very confident that he'll be able to crack the code to create a handheld device that was a phone. And the rest is history. But what made St Steve Jobs of Apple, Pixar Animation, and Next Computers become who he was? Let's look at his, mind, his mindset. In the commencement speech that he gave at the University of Stan, Stanford, he revealed a, a bit of what he, he, he thought, a, a bit of what makes him, you know, so successful. Let's look at that. My third story is about death. When I was 17, I read a quote that went something like, if you live each day as if it was your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. <laughs> it made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, 
If today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet, <laughs> death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is secondary. You need to follow. If you're a child of God, you need to follow what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about. And the Holy Spirit knows exactly what God's plan for you is. And he puts those ideas into your heart, waiting for you to seize the opportunity. So the question is, if there's no more time, okay, if there's no more time, what should you and I be doing now? Second Peter 3, 10 to 12. Second Peter chapter 3, 10 to 12 says this. But the day of the Lord will come as, on, as an unexpected thief. And the earth and everything in it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should, should you live? Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. And the question is, since everything around us is going to be destroyed with fire. People's lives, people actually, you know, get to the point where they get to God's, the end. What is being described here? In many ways. Some, of, some, of, some people will wait to see this happen physically. Some will have to die and go to the Father. And their own journey begins, their own end, their own judgment begins. And so nobody's exempt from this. And don't think, oh, this whole story is all about something that will never happen. It will happen. And sometimes it starts when we leave the earth. So while well, the question is, so if, if this is what is going to happen, if we have an end, if we have a finite time, if our time comes to an end and our lives are short here on earth, what should we do? What should be our attitude? Okay. And one thing I'll tell you is do not delay the things the Lord has put in your heart to do. Whatever it is the Lord has put in your heart to do, do not question, do not ask questions, do not try and find the logic behind it. Just do it. Just do it. Is it because of the one thing I've learned about life is that there is a season for everything that God will ask you to do. When that season comes to an end, it becomes difficult, sometimes even impossible, to do that same thing that was easy a few weeks back, a few months back, a few years back. It becomes difficult or, or, or almost impossible to do again. So all of God's instructions, they are all timed. <laughs> And we are told in the we read earlier on that we should seize the opportunity that we have. So, do you have a book idea? You want to write a book? There's a book you've already written, a book is in your mind. 
go write the book, go and publish the book. Thank God it's a lot easier now to publish books. You can self-publish. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Do you have a song you have written? You want to produce it? Thank God these days it's easier. You can have you know, your own personal stu studio and we help a few people get, you can get that out. Is there somebody you want to meet? Is there a business you need to start? You know, these days things have become a lot easier. Do not wait. Do not delay that which God has put in your heart to do. You want to start a podcast, a devotional? Then begin. Start. Do not wait. For every time, all of these things that God puts in our hearts, they have a time allotment for, for, for them. And when that time gets past, it becomes difficult or impossible to do them again. We need to be, we need to be those, those people, those Christians who, when we just hear God speak, we do. We don't wait to seek too many opinions. We don't wait to find the logic behind it. We don't wait to look for why can, can it not work. We just do it in obedience. If God has actually to do it, just do it. I'll share some of my own personal testimonies as I come to an end. <clears throat> I remember when my first child was born, and a few weeks into the raising of this, this, this child, or let me say a few months into raising of my first child, I was so overwhelmed by what it takes to, <laughs> to take care of it, to, to, to keep a child alive, to take care of the every need of a child, that one day I told my wife, I'm traveling back to see my. My, my parents. She asked, what is that? I'm just, I just want to go home and tell them thank you. And that's what I did. I traveled home and they saw me, they were happy. That's oh, what happened. Well, I, they didn't expect you to come and say, yes, it's true. I, well, is there any special thing? I said, no, there's no special thing. I just came to tell you and to you both, my dad and my, and my, and my mom, thank you for what you did in taking care of me and every one of my siblings. And I say that because I'm experiencing taking care of just one child. <laughs> and I know, you know, and, I, and I, I really appreciate what you guys have done. My parents are late, both of them. But they heard that from me. A few years ago, I, I wrote a letter to each one of my siblings. I'm the last of five children. So I wrote a letter to each one of them. Letting them know how much they have influenced my life. Letting them know all the great things that God has done through them for me. Letting them know how much I honor and appreciate them. I wrote that letter and sent to each one of them. It was just an idea God put in my heart. And do you know, there's one of them who have had, my, my senior sister, who have had a very frosty relationship, you know, because of some few issues that, 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 that happened. And that letter that I wrote to her helped us reconnect. After years of, you know, being pulled apart. And, you know, she died in 2020. But she heard, before she died, she heard what I thought of her. How I'd forgiven her for everything <clears throat> that happened between us. But what am I saying? You cannot afford to delay anything that God has put in your heart. I want you to ask yourself the question, what are you doing with your time? Are you doing like what God has asked you to do to redeem your time? Because your time is short. And judgment starts for you and for me when we sleep in the Lord. So I'm praying that this short message will touch your heart and will spur you on to being everything God wants you to be and deserve. What a timely message. What a timely message. For every one of us, we need to redeem the time. For some of us, the first thing we need to do is to give our lives to Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. Time lost over the years, can be redeemed today as we decide to give our lives to Jesus Christ. For some others here, there are things that God has asked you to do 
that you've not done over the years. This is an opportunity for you to redeem the time. So if you're here and you've not given your life to Jesus Christ or you want to recommit your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to pray. Talk to him from your heart. Ask him to come in and do out with you. Ask him to become the Lord of your life. Let us pray. My Father, my God, I thank you. You are says that you will in no wise cast out anyone who comes to you. And Lord God, the people here who are asking, Lord, the Lord, they want you to be their Lord and their Savior. They don't want to do life the way they have done it in the time, in time past. But they're asking you, Lord, to come in and fill their heart, to cleanse their sins, to instruct them, King of glory, and help them live life like it ought to be lived. My Father, my God, I pray for each one of them. I ask my Father, my God, that it will be true repentance. I also pray, my Father, my God, that Lord, you give them the assurance of salvation, that from this day, from this moment, they will know that they are saved. And Lord, they will seek to live the life that pleases you. Yield it to you. The Lord God, they will walk upon the earth with the glory that Lord you've given unto every child of God. I ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. And for everyone here who needs to redeem the time, for one reason or the other, lost time over the years, Father, I pray, King of glory, Lord, that you give each one of us instruction, the right instruction that we need at this time. And that, Lord God, you give us the courage to obey you. Thank you, King of glory, Lord, for doing this for us. We we'll ask all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. But I will also pray for everyone who's been part of this celebration. As they go into a new week, Lord, your presence will be with them. You will go ahead of them. And Lord God, everything they had touches to do this week shall prosper. Thank you, Lord God, because you shall favor them this week. Yes, King of glory, Lord God, you shall instruct them this week. And at the end of this week, again, Lord God, we'll have great reason to thank you, to glorify you. Having had a successful week with you by our side, with you leading us. Thank you, Lord God, for answering our prayers. We ask all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I want to thank everybody who's here today. I want to pray that the Lord God will meet you at the point of your need. I will hope to see you next week by God's grace. God bless you. Have a victorious week. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>